All right, final question on the 2017 exam. Part A. So we want to find alpha to the k plus alpha to the negative k. Now, by de Moivre's theorem, when you raise that to the power k, you get cos k theta plus i sine k theta. And then for the minus k, it's just the same, but with minus k. So you've got cos minus k theta plus i sine minus k theta. And then minus k, cos of minus k theta, that's just the same thing as cos k theta. But for this one, it's negative because sine of a negative angle is the same as negative sine of the angle. And then that cancels with that, and we get 2 cos k theta. So that's it for part 1. Part 2. Now when they talk about summing the series, what they mean is that because this is a geometric series, because we've got a constant ratio of alpha, we can work out the sum of that using the formula where you go first term times 1 minus the constant ratio, which is alpha, time, uh, to the power of the number of terms there are. Now there's n terms there and n terms there, plus that one, so 2n plus 1. And then you divide that by 1 minus the constant ratio. And we have to show that that equals that. So let's see what we can do. Let's um, bring that into the numerator and expand that. So that times that, alpha to the minus n, and then that times that, we do the power minus n, so that'll be alpha to the n plus 1. Now let's think about where we're going. So we've got a, a 1 minus alpha there, but on the denominator of where we want to get to, there's a 1 minus conjugate of alpha as well. So maybe what we could do is multiply top and bottom by that. But we've got a bit of a problem that there's no conjugate of alpha in the top here. So let's think about what we could turn that into. So if alpha is cos theta plus i sine theta, then the conjugate of alpha is cos theta minus i sine theta. And by de Moivre's theorem, alpha to the minus 1 is cos negative theta plus i sine negative theta, which is just cos theta minus i sine theta, because that's just cos theta and that's negative sine theta. So alpha to the minus 1 is actually the same as the conjugate of alpha. And that only works with complex numbers that have um, a modulus of 1, like alpha does. So instead of having that, we can have alpha to the minus 1 there. So let's expand that. Alpha to the minus n times 1. Alpha to the minus n times that is going to be alpha to the negative n minus 1. Then we've got that times that. And that times that. Okay, and then we just need to rearrange that so that it's the same as that. And that's it for part two. Part three. Now this is what we concluded in part two. So let's see how we can apply the result of part one from that. Now, we're going to need to group them like this. So we can put the alpha to the minus n with the alpha to the n. And then you'll have, you know, on, and so on, down to um, alpha to the minus 1 plus the alpha to the 1, and then also the 1. And then on the right-hand side, uh, that is going to be that with k equals n, so 2 cos n theta. And then this one is 2 cos n plus 1 times theta. And let's expand that. 
So we've got the 1 minus alpha minus, um, I'll replace that with alpha to the minus 1 again. And then that times that is actually just 1. Okay, so on the left here we've got um, cos, sorry, 2 cos n theta again from part 1 and so on down to, there should be a plus there, to cos um, 1 theta and plus the 1. Now on the bottom here let's apply this again to this. So let's collect the ones that makes 2 and then you've got this is 2 cos um, theta because it's that with k equals 1. Okay, and then that is actually the same as that, so let's replace that. And then on the right hand side we've got this factor of 2 and everything that we can cancel out. And then that's it for part 3. Part 4. Now this is what we just concluded in part 3. So this is the same as that if theta equals pi on n, so it would be good to say something like let theta equal pi on n, and then just plug pi on n into here, and then let's see if we can simplify this. So that'll make cos pi, because the n's cancel, which is negative 1, and that one, so it's n pi plus pi over n, and then let's split that up because we can turn that into pi plus pi on n. Okay, where can we go from there? Well, what we could do is do the angle sum formula for that. So that's going to be cos pi cos pi on n, uh, and then you subtract so that, that will cancel with that negative there, and you get plus sine pi sine pi on n. And then cos of pi is negative 1, sine of pi is 0, so this is going to make negative 1, that negative will cancel with that one. And we have that. And then you'll notice this is actually the negative of the bottom. Like you could rewrite this as um, as that. So this just makes negative one because that cancels with that. Okay, good. Now we're trying to show that that is independent of n. What that means is just that it doesn't have an n in it, it's just a number, a constant number, and won't change when n changes. So let's just solve for this. So we could just uh, subtract 1 from both sides of the equation and divide by 2. And that will make, so negative 1 minus 1, and then divide by 2, that's negative 1. Uh, and over here we have all of that. Um, and then that's pretty much it, That like that's shown it, but if you like you could say something like which is independent of n. Part b. So let me draw you a graph so you can get an idea of what's going on here. We've got this hyperbola, which looks like that, where that is a, because that's the x-intercept if you plug in y equals 0, you get x is a or minus a. And then it's saying, um, well we've got a focus there and, and there, because we know the distance from the origin to the focus is the eccentricity times a, so if the eccentricity is 2, then this is at 2a, and this one's going to be at minus 2a. And we've been told that the distance from one of the foci to one of the vertices is 1, so I guess some people would miss the fact that this isn't the only way you can do it. Like you can say 
to a minus a equals 1 and that gives you a equals 1 but you could also have the distance from there to there being 1 or the distance from there to there so that would give you 2a minus negative a equals 1 or 3a equals 1 a equals a third so those are the two solutions part c so if you're confused about how to do this one, it might actually be a good idea to try to work out how they got x times x minus 1, because that'll give you a clue how to approach this kind of question. So the way they got that is that there are x choices for a, because a can be any color, and then we can't have b be the same color, which means that there are only x minus 1 choices for what color b can take. So that's how they get that. So we can do a similar thing with choosing the colors for c and d. Um, if C is the same color as B, then there's only one choice for C. You just have to pick whatever B is. And then D has to be a different color from these two. So that leaves X minus 1 colors to choose from. And it doesn't have to be different from A, so, it, so it's, it's just X minus 1, not X minus 2. But if we have that C is a different color from B, then um, the number of choices for C, well, it can't be the same as that one or that one. So that leaves x minus 2 different colors to choose from. And then d has to be different from b and c. So that's two color choices knocked out. So that leaves x minus 2 choices for d. So to say all of that, you can set it out something like this. So just say if c is the same color as b, then you've got one choice for c and x minus 1 choices for d. Otherwise, you get x minus 2 choices for both c and d. And then what you would do is you've got to multiply these to work out the total number of ways of, of choosing that. And then, because it's this or that, you add them. So that times that is the number of ways to do it, if C is different from B. And then we can just expand this and simplify. So x minus 1, that's x squared minus 4x plus 4. And that's it. Part two. For mathematical induction, the first thing you want to do is show that the proposition is true for n equals one. So just plug one into there. And then that's zero. So if this is one, that's x times x minus one. And we were told that that was the number of ways to do it for n equals one. So that's sort of true by definition. So you could say something like, it's true for n equals 1. And then what you want to do is assume that it's true for n equals k. So I like to write it as um, if the proposition is true with uh, k instead of n. So if that's true, then, OK, let's see how this is going to help us find uh, the number of ways of painting a 2 by k plus 1 grid. So in part one, what we showed is that that's the number of ways of doing two extra ones. So we showed it for, you know, if those ones are chosen, that's the number of ways of doing these two. That's also going to work if there's more stuff to the left of this, like if there's more little tiles there. Um, the number of ways of painting these two extra ones is still going to be that. So you could say something like, the next two tiles can be painted in x squared minus 3x plus 3 ways, which we showed in part 1. Therefore, a 2 times k plus 1 grid, um, let's work out the number of ways that can be painted in. So that's going to be the number of ways of painting all the tiles before that times that. So we can say that it's um, x times x minus 1. Just all of that times this. And then we can simplify that because that's the same as that. So that'll just be that. That many ways. Uh, okay, so we've shown that if it's true for n equals k, then it's also true for n equals k plus 1. And we've shown it's true for n equals 1. Therefore, 
by mathematical induction, it's true for all n greater than or equal to 1. And actually, I might say, instead of k there, I might say k plus 1 minus 1, because then that makes it clear that that's, um, like, that's our new n. So that's just this with n equals k plus 1. So I think that makes it a bit clearer. Part 3. So here's the formula we worked out in part 2 for a 2 by n grid. But the problem we have is that this doesn't require all of the colors to be used at least once. Um, but let's see what we can get if we just plug um, n equals 5 into that, and x is the number of colors, the so 3. So we'll have 3 times 3 minus 1. That's to the power 5 minus 1. So that's 3 by 2, that cancels with that. We've got 3 to the 4, which is 81. So that's 486. Now what we could do is take away the number of ways of painting the grid um, just using one or two of the colors. Well, there's actually no way to do it with just one color because the, all the tiles have to be different to the ones adjacent. So if we can work out the number of ways to color the grid just using two colors, then we can subtract that off. Um, the tricky part with this question is that if you just plug in uh, x equals 2 to this, which is sort of, I think, what most people would think of doing, um, that'll give you 2 times 1 times 4 minus 6, that's 1 as well. I'll just give you two. Now the answer isn't 484, like just that minus that, because there's actually three different ways you can do that. Like if the if the colors are like red, green, and blue, there's just painting the grid with red and green. There's two ways to do that. Then there's just painting it with green and blue. There's another two ways to do that. And then there's painting it with red and blue. So there's actually six different ways one for each color, like choice of color, that you miss out. So the answer is going to be 486 minus 3 times 2 for the three choices of which color to miss out. So 480. All right, that's it for the 2017 exam. Um, if you have any questions, still leave them in the comments below and I'll get back to you. And make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. If you missed out on any of the videos in this series, I'll put a link to the playlist there so you can see any of the other questions in this exam. And then there's also the 2016 exam. I did a walkthrough of that as well.